Yes. All right. I know that we have students from many different areas of business. We have freshmen. We have people with bad doses of senioritis who are still here today. So why is this topic so important? Creativity. We're going to have Professor Papo come up here in a little bit and talk to you about why this fits in so well for strategy. In my mind, the reason that I'm excited, apart from the speaker who is phenomenal, is this topic. When you go through business school, one of the concerns I have is that we focus so much on teaching you the terms, the techniques. When you come out, it's like we've beaten the creativity out of you, right? You go out into the marketplace, you have the same jargon, the same terms as everyone else out there. So what will differentiate you? How will you compete? It's your creativity, right? I was telling a group earlier, this is what I honestly believe. Computers anymore can do what you and I can do, right? Think of any number of number crunching. They can do it better than we do, they can do it faster than we do, and they do it with less attitude than we do, right? So it's a no-brainer, they are a better choice. What is it that's going to make you competitive out there? It's the essentially human trait. Oh, we have this, which is creativity. So I'm so pleased it cuts across whatever discipline you're in, it cuts across any class level you're in, and so I'm really pleased to bring our speaker. But first, let me bring up Professor Papo to tell you a little bit about why this is so important right now. I'm Professor Laura Papo, and I'm an instructor in Management 498. And the idea of having this seminar for all 498 students, as well as others, was to begin to show you business and practice. And so when I think about why I was so excited about the opportunity to have Steve Coonan here, it was because of the industry he's operating in. And there's just one word to say about this industry, and it's change. Now just think about it. When you were a toddler and you were being plugged in to the TV because your caregiver, if there were anything like I was, it was time to watch TV, your parents would put you in front of the TV and you might watch something off a cable, you might look at something like your favorite Walt Disney movie, Cinderella, and that's how you watched your t entertainment. Nowadays, my guess is your favorite way to watch entertainment is on your laptop. And you might be hooked up into cable, you might be accessing it through YouTube, Hulu, Netflix, but the industry has changed. And why? Technology. It's one of the major forces that can change an industry. And so when you have an industry that's undergoing change like this, it's a really hard job, and you need a visionary. And so that's why I was so excited to have Steve Kuhn in here. Because if you don't really chart your course, you're gonna be like Blockbuster, right? They're closing doors. They didn't know how to respond. The other reason you need a visionary is that when you have changes in the industry, sometimes it makes it harder to make money. And my guess is Turner is going to have to think very creatively now about what you value so they can charge you for it because there's a lot of content out there. So I'm going to introduce right now Steve Coonan, and I've already told you he's a smart visionary. Well, where did this come from? He spent 12 years at Coca-Cola as vice president of marketing. Then he joined Turner Entertainment in 2002, and he started off with one network, but quickly went to three. Each one of these networks has major accomplishments in the series they've put out. I'm not going to read through them, but just take it as affirmation of his ability to lead, empower, and manage the fact that he was selected for TV's guide, The Power List, and he was named by Entertainment Weekly as one of the smartest people in television. That's amazing. So without further ado, Yes, I want to say his most important credential here, first of all, I already told him they should drop the in television. 
I think I've met one of the smartest people ever. Thank you. But the most important credential that Mr. Coonan brings today is that he's a Jayhawk dad because Amy goes to school here, right? Absolutely. That's the most important thing. Absolutely. Take it away. Thank you. And thank you, Professor, for that wonderful introduction. It dovetails to what I was going to talk about today, which is our world is changing. And it used to be simple. You plopped in front of the TV and you watched the TV, and here came the VCR. People started taping television. Now we've got DVR, streaming, more devices, services, Netflix, StreamPix, Roxy, Boxy, Arrow, Apple TV, VOD, SVOD, Hulu, Vudu, Xbox, PS3. Ustream, and every one of them screaming and vying for your TV watching attention. And the change that's happening to us is happening everywhere. Media is under attack by technology. In 2009, the iPad didn't exist. Think about that. Three short years ago, there was no iPad. The first year, they sold 10 million units. We're predicting by 2015, there'll be almost 115 million iPads that instantly connect you, that are HD television screens. But the technology is so awesome. It's so wonderful. But in my business, it's nothing more than a can opener. And it's the can opener to great content. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, how content has real value and how ideas create content. Now. The secret to creativity is ideas and how you adapt and link them to strategy. Now, I thought I'd start by telling you a little bit about me. Um, I figured out years ago that my best shot in the business world was a different route through creativity and through ideas. I went to the University of Georgia in the 70s when you needed $79 or a pulse to get in. Um, and if you had the 79, it didn't really even matter if you had a pulse. It was a very unique time, and I majored in liquor. And I'm being serious. <laughs> I'm being very serious. I wanted to be in the spirits business. I worked in liquor stores all through college. I enjoyed the business. I read every periodical I get my hands on. And when I got out of school, I went to work for a distributor. And I worked for a few years for a distributor selling wine and spirits to restaurants, liquor stores around Atlanta. And then if you did a pretty good job, you got noticed. And I got hired by a distillery. I got hired by Hiram Walker, which makes Canadian Club, Kahlua, Quavassier, and dozens of other brands. So I, I went to work for this um, distiller, Hiram Walker. And at the age of 27, I got a call from the president of the company one day who said, congratulations, we want to make you head of worldwide marketing. Wow, that's a pretty big deal, 27 years old. I said, that's fantastic. I'm so excited. Thank you. I'm humbled by, by the offer. And he said, yep, we want you to move up here to headquarters. And I, the light bulb screamed off in my head. Headquarters is in Walkerville, Ontario, Canada. There are three things in Walkerville, Ontario, Canada. There is a distillery, there is a Chrysler plant, and there is a renowned strip club. <laughs> Some of those I really don't enjoy. I don't, I don't like Chryslers at all. Um, <laughs> And so I, um, I said to them, no, thank you. I'm going to stay. I'll run the southeast region. And, you know, in a couple of years, we'll see. I was recently married. And they said, no, you don't understand. Your job's being eliminated. I said, excuse me, you think enough of me to hire me to run worldwide marketing, but you don't think enough of me to keep my job? They said, that's right, we're restructuring. And I learned at that moment, corporations aren't people. Corporations are going to do what's best for the business. So I did what was best for me, and I said thank you, and I left, and I didn't have a job. So I started looking, and I picked up the phone, and I called, this is before you had to dial area codes, but I'll give you the area code, 404-676-2121, and literally said, director of marketing, please. And a guy picked up the phone himself, and I pitched him right on the phone. I introduced myself, and I said, I see an opportunity for your business. This was 1986. A lot of you weren't born yet, so I feel really old and miserable right now. But it was 1986, and I said, there's a real opportunity. Mothers Against Drunk Driving is on the rise. Designated Driver is a great program. Coca-Cola could be an industry leader in the bar and tavern side of the business by creating designated driver programs. I think it'll increase volume and the quality of the way people perceive the company. He was very interested. He hired me, asked me to come on in, and 
Unfortunately, they did not have any open positions, so they hired me as a contract consultant. Make a long story short, 90 days later, I got fired. All the contract consultants were eliminated because they were having a tough year. This was after New Coke and a few other things. And so I said, um, excuse me, if you read my contract, you will see that you either have to pay my contract in full or I have 60 days to find another job. So obviously they didn't want to pay me, so they gave me 60 days. On the 58th day, and this is a true story verbatim, um, I, a guy walked out of the promotions group, got mad, left. And he's, um, so they offered me a temporary 30 more day extension. On my very first day, the president of the company came down to the promotions group and said I need help. Now, it was regarding the chicken crisis of 86. How many, have you studied that? In fact, is that a major offer here? How many of you study the chicken crisis of 86? And don't BS me. Put your hand down, Alyssa. Um, the chicken crisis of 86 was when McDonald's announced they were launching the McChicken sandwich. And what that mattered was the cost of chicken went from 49 cents a pound to over $5 a pound. And we had an account called Church's Fried Chicken. And I, are all of you familiar with churches? Inner city, urban, their motto is big pieces, little prices. So Church's Fried Chicken was in trouble. Their cost of goods was going up tenfold. They would have to sell wings and thighs and legs, which are not desirable pieces to their constituency, in order to stay in business. Well, Pepsi saw an opportunity at this point in time, and Pepsi said to churches, we will pay you $5 million to switch from Pepsi, from Coke to Pepsi. And so the gun was really pointed at our heads at Coke. This is my very first day. So the brief that we got were, come up with some ideas to sell these undesirable pieces of chicken for churches, or you're fired, basically. So that was at 9 o'clock in the morning. Went back to our cubes. We didn't have computers in. We didn't have any way to goof off. People just stared at each other. <laughs> and um, 5 o'clock that afternoon, we went up to the executive floor, and we had to pitch. The per first person was eviscerated. The second person left in a crying mass, and then it's my turn. And I said, well, I have an idea. In 26 of Church's top 28 markets, there's an NBA team. And there's a phenomenon happening in the NBA this year. There's a guy, his name is Spud Webb. And Spud Webb is magic. He's five foot five. He can fly. He has wings. And the opposite of him has also came into the NBA this year. His name is Manut Bol. He is seven foot seven. In essence, nothing but legs. So I created, one slide too late, the Manute Bowl Spud Webb meal. You could get a Manute Bowl meal, which was a box full of legs and a large Coke, or a Spud Webb meal, which was wings, potatoes, and a small Coke. <laughs> An hour later, I am on a private jet flying to San Antonio, Texas, <laughs> to meet with the board. I called my wife from a payphone because there were no cell phones and said, um, I, I'm going by jet to San Antonio. She said, get home, click the phone down. Um, because she couldn't believe that literally, I went and presented to the board of churches. We saved the business. This grew their business double digits and became one of those icons. And I actually, of all the things that I've been fortunate enough to do, this is one of the few mementos I kept because it reminds me of how creativity and, and ideas became my currency. Um, I've been fortunate. I've worked with great people on big, fun ideas. And through those projects, I've learned a bunch of lessons. And I thought I would share some of them with you today. The first one is take a fresh look. What I love about children is they don't see the world as we do. By the time we get to your age, we've beaten all the creativity and fun out of you, like what's been said, and it's been about a regiment. Kids look at the world with a different pair of eyes. And when I came to Turner, I wanted to use that childlike wonderment, that sense of discovery, to look at our brands and our business with a different set of eyes. I was brought to Turner to build brands. In the days of Ford Broadcast Network and a few big cable networks, you really could be everything, variety. It was all about availability, about distribution, which is something I'm sure you've learned in business school. But now it becomes about choice, and that's where brands come in, because brands help you navigate to make choice. So we had to put on a new lens. And let me just give you a quick refreshment. This is what the network variety field looked like in 2000, I mean, excuse me, 1999. You want me to produce your war? 
Everything you want is right here on TNT. Everything you want's right here. Variety. It's got everything. It means nothing. So we started our quest by talking to consumers. And one of the big issues we found out was the name. It was named for Turner. History Channel. It's going to have history. Food Network. Be about food. TNT. Well, it was named for the creator. I don't mean that one. I mean Ted Turner. He, he named him for himself. So we said to consumers, draw what's in your head. Let's really understand what's in your head and draw what you think of the network. And you see basketball, westerns, cowboy movies, and a lot of question marks. And what that said to us, we were known for our parts, not the sum of our parts. So it's imperative that we wrap all those together and build something. But before we could do that, we really had to understand how viewers perceive television, the psychographics. I'm in the demographic business. We sell 18 to 34 eyeballs, 18 to 49, 25 to 54 men, women. I am an eyeball farmer. If somebody says, what do you do? I farm eyeballs. How disgusting is that? But it's true, we sell audiences, which are, uh, so what we wanted to understand was hearts and minds. We really wanted to get in there. So I wanna take you through the five groups that we found and see if possibly you can relate to some of them. The first is what we call the cultural high brows. Those, these people do not care for television. They do not like it. They call it the idiot box. They limit what their children can watch. We do not care for these people. <laughs> The next is called TV worshipers. Why? Because I'm not allowed to call them couch potatoes. That would be offensive. These people watch, on average, more than 42 hours of television a week. TV for them is a full-time job. Needless to say, we love these people. They watch everything. And then we have competition lovers. Guys, tell me if this is you. This is like a school of fish. They move from sport to sport, and then they watch highlights of the sports they just watched. They're not loyal, they do not want to be touched emotionally, all they want to see is sports and highlights of sports. The opposite of that is comedy lovers. Comedy lovers are usually young women, and comedy is cathartic for them, it's a release. After a hard day, they want to laugh, it makes them feel better, it's their endorphins, it's their Prozac. And then lastly, drama lovers. These are people who want television that touches their hearts and mind. Stories that make them think and feel. And we decided that we're going to have to grow by shrinking. We're going to have to make choices. So we got rid of the highbrows who we never would have gotten. We got rid of the comedy lovers who probably wouldn't be predisposed. And we went for competition lovers because those men love live sports drama, and we have that. TV worshipers, as I said, they watch everything. And the drama lovers became our bullseye, and we discovered our target that day. Now, we're all adults here. Even though it's being taped, I'm a little uncomfortable with the next part being on tape, but um, I'm going to drop a lot of F-bombs today. And one of the things I suggest to you is that you really understand the F-word. Yep, talking about focus. That's the F-word. That's the scary word to companies and businesses. In your life, you face choices. In careers, you face choices. And in business, you face choices. So we had to say, that focus was one of our key criteria for building a brand. It had to be focused, it had to be relevant, it had to consistently deliver, and we needed to be first and unique in the market. And so TNT has been, for more than a decade, the first and only network dedicated to drama. And when we say drama, again, that's code for television that touches your heart and your mind, and television that makes you think and makes you feel. Here's where the F word comes in, WCW our highest rated program was on TNT. Now, how does a business get rid of its biggest product? How does Domino's stop selling pizza? How does KU not have basketball anymore? How do you do that? Well, you take a deep breath and you look at the long term. And we knew that staying the same, being a general entertainment network, would not lead us down the path to prosperity. So we decided that we would grow by shrinking, we would grow our business by shrinking our focus, and we canceled our number one show, the only time it's ever been done in history. We had to slaughter that sacred cow. And to make TNT the home of drama, we had to make choices. We had to define our brand and tell people what drama is, because drama can mean so many things. Mary J. Blige, no more drama. She's a drama queen. Oh, melodrama, soap operas, what does it mean? So we thought the best authorities on dramas were actors. Take a look at William H. Macy, who won six Emmys for us, and what he says drama is to him. 
I think a great drama gives you all of the emotions. You know, it's one of them rules of Hollywood. You want to get them laughing, get them crying. You want to get them crying, get them laughing first. So it's a roller coaster ride. And we're with the hero on this root and tootin' journey, and we don't know where it's going to go. So we use stars to build testimonials, to talk about what drama is, conflict, love, romance. We, in, we just did hundreds and hundreds of spots in this distinctive black and white look. And we built a brand that today, we don't have to have people testify for it because it's widely accepted that TNT is drama. And what you see on the right is our new graphic look. We're selling drama and it's owned by TNT. And so, if I may, let me show you what TNT looks like today, 12 years later, um, with all of our original programming. <laughs> Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor, I would. I'd love to go to the window, look at all the sunshine. <laughs> yeah, that's the president. It's Jimmy Stewart. Oh. Right in the eyes. Well, that can do serious damage to the cornea. This is my thought, yes. Is that it? You ladies, give me a couple of minutes, please. <laughs> this is nuts. So, we do no drama. Now, another way to look at focus is really what kind of animal you want to be. In front of you, I present an idea we borrowed from the author Jim Collins for good to great. Here's a fox and who's a head and here's a hedgehog. Well, the fox is sleeper, sleeker, sexier. She's a fox. He's a fox. Nobody wants to be called a hedgehog. I am extraordinarily proud to be a hedgehog because a hedgehog does one thing and does it really well. They go straight to their destination without distraction. A fox darts everywhere. Ooh, there's a squirrel. Ooh, there's an acorn. Ooh, 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 ooh. Hedgehog, one thing, straight to the destination. In TNT, we did that with drama. And with our other networks, True TV, which was formerly Court TV, with Outrageous Unscripted, TBS, the largest comedy network on television, and Turner Classic Movies, which is the only network with the director's vision, never edited for content length and 100% commercial free. So we've built these networks and to program each one, we have to take huge risks. Television, usually nine out of 10 shows fail. It makes a restaurant business look like a good business. So you have to make bets, you must gamble, but you have to be smart about what you, what you bet. We don't really like making bets, we like making smart wagers. And the best bets, I thought I'd show you, one of them seems so obvious today. But in 2005, we heard about this guy he was touring the Southeast on what was called the Chitlin Circuit, working small African-American theaters, doing plays before audiences. And he scraped together his money from that, and he did a movie called Diary of a Mad Black Woman. And it became a very big hit. And we started paying attention, and we started having conversations with this Atlanta-based creator. And we saw an opportunity with a fresh pair of eyes that African-American women were un an underserved audience. A huge part of the population, but nothing for them. Since Diane Carroll starred in Room 222 in the 70s, there hasn't been a show with an African-American female lead. So we connected with a guy named Tyler Perry, and Tyler made us a proposition. He would pay to test 10 episodes out of his pocket, which is violating one of the cardinal rules of Hollywood, paying for your own product. And we would, if successful, order 100 episodes. Well, we did it, he did it. Tyler Perry, for the past several years, has been the highest paid entertainer in America because we created a su successful business by seeing an opportunity that others didn't see. So there's lots of lessons in that experience. We don't make bets on a whim. We load the dice with research and with data. We study everything. For Tyler, we looked at the TV landscape and saw a huge opportunity 
to serve the underserved African-American female market. And we found a base that responded to our actions. Now, another bet that also looks like a no-brainer today was we just made with Dallas. Again, we looked at the TV landscape and saw that there was a real opportunity for primetime soaps. Desperate Housewives was going off the air, Brothers and Sisters were going off the air, and there wasn't that juicy, salacious, fun soap. And the, one, the granddaddy who invented them all was Dallas. So we decided to bring it back. And we jumped in when we had the right message, the right team, and the right script. Um, there's an article from Entertainment Weekly that says, Dallas roared back to life, good as ever. And I love that, that's terrific acclaim, but what I really like is the way the article started. There was no good reason to think it would work. We took a chance, we took a risk. The critic didn't think it would work, but he was thrilled with it, and so was the public, as this became one of the top shows of the new year. Let me show you Dallas. Nobody gives you power, real power. Is something you take. Power. I'm going to be the next governor. I'm putting you in charge. Greed. You and all is back in business. That's not gonna happen, JR. Rivalry. You know, just because I'm fighting fair doesn't mean I won't fight. They're all back. Promise me you're the man I think you are. And no one does it quite like the Ewings. You've been in on this from the beginning, and you know it. Is this really about South Fork, or is it about Atlanta? Dallas. JR's big mistake was he always underestimated me. Is the one place... How am I supposed to trust a single word that comes out of your mouth? There's something I need to tell you. You know I'm good at trouble. Me too. That's got it all. I'm back, honey. And I'm gonna be bigger than ever. Dallas. TNT. Now, since the days of the VCR, people predicted the death of television. But TV viewing's at an all-time high, over 34 hours a week for the average American. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In fact, we're the only media that's flourished in the digital age. Almost everything else has been is down or been obliterated. Radio, newspapers, magazines, books, music, DVD. Digital has wiped them out, but TV has stayed strong because we've kept the ecosystem strong. Online streamers who are watching Netflix and Hulu actually are entertainment junkies who watch more television than other audiences. We see great strength in the belief that people love television. However, we can't rest on our laurels. As leaders, we have to know what our strengths are and what our weaknesses is. And one of our lessons is know your strength. There are very few people who are strong at everything. I'm a lot of things, but there's a lot of things I'm not. I'm not an actor, I'm not a writer, I'm not a producer. I'm a UGA and KU fan. Yeah. Thank you, honey. And I'm a dad to the person who interrupted my speech. <laughs> what I needed to be and what I've become is an environmentalist. Now, I don't mean like a tree hugger or a Prius driver. I'm not into that crap. <laughs> what I'm talking about is building an environment for creativity. Doesn't mean every idea has to come from the top, doesn't have to come from me. You have to build a creative environment where failing is applauded, mistakes are celebrated and learned, and you build an environment for people to do their best work. In fact, that is the Turner Company philosophy. We find the best people, we create the best ideas, we build an environment where they can succeed. And if they succeed, we succeed. One example of that is Conan O'Brien. Conan O'Brien had a 17-year successful run on The Late Late Show on NBC, and he stepped into the Johnny Carson revered seat on The Tonight Show. And I think we all know what happened. And seven months after he took over The Tonight Show, he was fired in a very loud um, way. When he left, and the NBC lawyers put in his severance agreement, that he could not communicate via any media, and they were specific, television, radio, print, but they left one out, Twitter. They weren't aware of the power of Twitter. So Conan O'Brien went on Twitter. His first tweet I read for you today. Today, I interviewed a squirrel in my backyard and then threw to a commercial. Somebody help me. Conan O'Brien quickly created, saw the groundswell of support that came for him digitally as his Twitter account exploded to over 7 million followers as he has now. And we saw an opportunity. We brought Conan to TBS. 
And when we brought them, we knew we were getting a great talent. We knew it was a big deal. We knew it was newsworthy. But we needed to build and put him in an environment where he'd have the opportunity to succeed. We needed Conan to be more than just an hour-long late-night talk show host. We wanted to capture that digital groundswell that became a tidal wave of support for him when he left NBC. So we found the right talent, we built the right environment, and we launched Team Coco, which is the Conan digital site. And Conan went from being a traditional talk show host to a multimedia hit. In fact, two weeks ago, Conan's app and Team Coco won the Emmy for the best digital product on, affiliated with television. And Conan has more Twitter followers and Facebook fans than any late night show host. In fact, 80% of the people watching Conan online don't watch him on TBS. He's become, as Fast Company celebrates, a digital rock star. He's adapted in changing times, and he's successful in multiple formats. I could argue that Conan's truly the first convergent TV show that's digested both linearly and digitally. And the key here was Conan wasn't going to fail. He saw the opportunity, and we saw the opportunity together to build an exciting, dynamic new business. Now, I've shared a lot of successes with you today, but every company, every person has failures, and I wanted to share some of those. First, our belief is ideas are like disposable diapers. When they're full of crap, you throw them away. And that's great advice. Sometimes I wish I listened to that great advice. We had a movie coming to TNT, The Perfect Storm. Y'all remember the movie? Fishing captain goes out to sea, George Clooney, Mark Wahlberg, great cast. So we're going to launch it in January, and I want to make a big deal out of this. I want to get people's attention. And so we came up with this idea, and notice the crawl on a regular episode of Law and Order on the bottom. His own gun. I love this. So he killed the girl, killed himself, and then threw the gun out the window. Come on. He had the gun in the apartment for three years. The wife didn't know about it. The kid didn't know about it. But how would Doug Phillips know? Well, the wife's alibi is shot. So you have means and opportunity. What about motive? Try blonde at 30. How many of you knew that bah, bah, bah was the exclusive property of the Federal Communications Commission? <laughs> I could have used that help a few years ago. 166,000 complaints. Um, people don't like hearing that weather emergency thing and then you're tuning into a movie. Did not work well. Uh, let's see, the FCC tried to fine us, but thank God they're not have jurisdiction over cable. And I learned that there is a line, and then there's a line to step over. Scaring people to watch your TV network is not a line to step over. I also had another experience. It was the millennium. The year 2000, there was so much excitement. Everybody remember? 2YK. Y2K. I haven't gotten it right, and I've done this speech three times today. Y2K. We sat in a room and we brainstormed. How are we going to come up with ideas? How can Coke break through the clutter? And I came up with an idea, and I based it on an article I read. One of the things that I've always done is read as much as I could publications, articles, and try to create connections. I read an article about a professor in Texas who was measuring the distance between Earth and the moon. And the headline of the article is the moon moves six inches closer to the Earth. But when I read it and understood it, the way he measured it, he didn't have a giant tape measure. He shot a laser and measured it as it bounced back. And so I contacted this professor and asked if the laser could be seen. Could, did it leave a mark on the moon or some kind of signal? He said, yes, we saw it in telescopes, made sure it was effective. I said, well, could you create a whole pattern of those? Could you, in essence, on the morning of Y2K, wake up and there'll be a Coca-Cola logo on the moon? And he said, I think it's doable. And I said, let's do it. So I literally went to my boss, got huge amounts of money, went out there and started working on the plan. This is when you have to realize when an idea is not a good idea. And so when the Federal Aviation Administration said, we're concerned it could cut planes in half, that's when you need to let it go, rather than when my boss, 
the chairman of Coke, was being interviewed by Business Week, they asked me a question, and here was my quote. I whined. It actually would have worked, but the FAA was worried about the risk of us slicing airplanes in half. If you use the term slicing airplanes in half, not a good idea. So ideas are like disposable diapers. When they're full of crap, I should have thrown that one away. But the good news is a lot of things have worked very well for us. In my tenure, we've doubled revenues and tri tripled profits for the Turner Entertainment Networks. TNT has been praised with numerous Emmys, year-round original schedule. TBS is a leader in late night in the younger audience and renewed growth. True TV has taken over for Court TV with younger unscripted strength and TCM, the crown jewel in our portfolio, just won the prestigious Peabody Award for its contributions. Um, my last lesson is serious work doesn't have to be serious. Work should be fun. You should enjoy every day you're doing something and if you're miserable, it's not a good idea to continue to do that. I use humor as a tool. I use it as a way to manage people, a way to inspire people, a way to lead people. Humor disarms, it makes tough situations better. Um, just because you have a hammer doesn't mean you should use it. And as a boss, as a leader, as a manager, fear is a terrible motivator. There's not much there. It might work short term, it never will work long term. And I think my best lesson I learned, I think was in kindergarten, it was a golden rule. Treat people the way you want to be treated. And as a leader of a large organization, I want to treat people the way that I want to be treated. And that's with respect and with opportunity. But they want to be led with a vision and with a strategy. And hopefully, we're able to continue to deliver that. So I wrap up today, first of all, thanking all of you very much for coming. I know it was mandatory, but I still appreciate it. Um, and hopefully this made some sense to you. We believe that creativity is the currency for the future. There will be more technologies, but I think it was well said, machines can't create the ideas that we can. So use a fresh look and a fresh perspective. Don't be afraid of that F word of focus. Place your bets, take risks. Know your strengths, but also know your weaknesses. Don't be afraid to fail. And serious work doesn't have to be serious. So. I appreciate you letting me do some fun work today and coming and speaking to you, and I thank you very much. So we are going to entertain a Q&A period right now, and it's a very healthy competition among um, business students, and we have a judge of who asked the best question, and best is really up there, so there might be multiple best winners, and Casey will be um, our judge, she's looking down it, so if you know her, you might want to get to know her better, or at least tell her how great you are. Um, but I will supply prizes to our best questions, so in order to track um, this, you need to say your name, and it would be helpful if you gave us your instructor's name, so we have a way to coordinate um, to get together. Bring it on. Madam President. Hi, my name is Anna Bolton, and I just wanted to ask who your professional role model was throughout your career. Hmm. That's a good question. I, I was very close to a gentleman, Doug Ivester, who was the chairman of Coke. I was very close to a gentleman named Ike, Ira Herbert, who was the head of marketing at Coke. And I leaned on people for advice, but I didn't feel like a formal mentoring. I, I'm very lucky that I do mentor a few people, and it feels a little bit more connected and, and formal, but I learned some great lessons from some great people. And a guy named Michael Ovitz, who founded the Creative Artist Agency, which is the biggest talent agency in Hollywood, also had a profound effect on my career. It was a very good question. Yes, sir. Yeah, my name's Phil Cole. Um, do you uh, enjoy your own programming, or by the end of the day, you kind of burn out on figuring out how to promote it? Um, I love TBS comedies. I'm a big fan of comedy. Uh, I wasn't a big drama fan, I'm a huge sports nut. So this is my favorite time of year because there's literally a championship or a major football game on every night. But I've learned to love some of our dramas. I love Dallas, Dallas, I literally asked my wife out for my first date with her on the finale of Dallas in May 6, 1983. And she said, I'd like to go out with you 
but I don't want to miss Dallas. <laughs> and I said, I have a VCR, and I literally taped it. We went out and we watched it, and we've been married tw 27 years. So I like that show. Um, and then we had a huge hit on The Closer. Yes, ma'am. Well, the greatest lens for creativity is strategy. An idea, a random idea, I, we call it idea -ria. You know, just somebody who's got a lot of ideas. That's not really structured. What we're looking for, and what I hope I showed you today, is ideas in search of a strategy. We wanted to be in late night television. It was an area of advertising dollars we weren't getting. We went for Conan O'Brien. We wanted to be, um, we wanted to be branded. Those are key seminal things. So ideas have to be tethered to strategy or otherwise you don't have a lens. There is a Dilbert cartoon that came from the newspaper that I've had for 20 years that I keep in my office. And it says company with a strategy. And you see a guy on the phone who says, no, we don't do that. And then you see company without a strategy. Sure, we'll try it. And so when you have a strategy, you have a filter. So that is our filter. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Nayi uh, My question is, uh, you know, sometimes when we read articles from newspapers or watch programs on TV, uh, we read the articles about uh, good ideas, we think, OK, that's a good idea. I can also think like that. But the fact is, most of us cannot uh, just write new ideas or good ideas after that. So uh, what do you think is the reason why people cannot be creative? and not new and fresh ideas be created? Okay, well that's a, why can't people be creative? I, I'll talk in the lens of television first. There's a lot of people who can come up with ideas for a TV show. What's so hard is the execution. I do think the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world who had an idea and went and executed it are within all of our grasps. It's just a matter of the scope and scale and your ability to take risks. You know, every time you drive down a street, you see somebody's idea brought to life, whether it's a store or a bar or, a, or an advertisement. So I believe that all of it's within reach, but it focuses keenly on the execution. And that's a very hard thing. I have this desire to say good question, but I don't want to influence the jury. So everybody's question's been great. Yes, ma'am. Hey, uh, so in your career, how do you make people around you trust them? So how do you make your coworkers? Well, I, I think sometimes, how do I make my coworkers trust my decisions? Sometimes it's not being aware that they didn't trust it. Uh, and, and I'm being very sincere. Um, we made a movie in 2002 called Door to Door. And I don't know if any of you have seen it. And if you haven't, it's magnificent. William H. Macy starred in it. And it was a true story of a door-to-door -door salesman who had cerebral palsy. And he could barely walk, and he carried a 40-pound case in his gnarled hand. He didn't speak where you could understand him. He did not look attractive. And several people said, I don't think this will work, because it's kind of the antithesis of television, where you see very pretty people and kind of uplifting stories. And I believed, and I took a stand that time, um, that the story was so good that it needed to be told, and if it didn't work, it was a noble effort. It was a huge rating success, and it won six Emmy Awards. It's probably the most successful program I've ever been affiliated with from an award standpoint. And sometimes you gotta just trust your gut. I go against the grain, and I'm often wrong. But the good news is sometimes I'm right, and it pays big dividends. You have to trust yourself. And it's a hard thing to do at your age because you're used to people telling you what to do. Your parents tell you what to do. Your professors tell you what to do. You have assignments to do. You don't have a lot of independent thinking. But as you build your business career, you will have to count on your own instincts. And I can assure you they will serve you well if you do your work to prepare for those. See, I told you what to do. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, my name is Brad Grinshaw, and uh, as a fellow sports nut, uh, one of the things I admire is your guys' decision to uh, air the first and second round on uh, True TV. And uh, I guess my question for you is, how does that change your strategy, and uh, has it been profitable and successful so far? 
So the question is, why do we air the first and second round games of March Madness on True TV? Well, I'm going to bet without March Madness, you might not have even know True TV existed. In fact, 47% of the viewers who have come to us to watch basketball were not even aware of the network. So the first thing we did is we built awareness for the network, which is very important. The second thing we did was brought high-profile programming, so we became, made advertisers aware of the network. And the third thing we were able to do is that we'll be able to go charge more to our affiliates because of the quality of programming we're bringing. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, my name is Kathy Keller, my uh, instructor is Kathy Curlis. And um, you talk a lot about creativity and ideas, um, but a lot of that was based, and a lot of the decisions were based on, I assume, a lot of data mining and a lot of strategy. Um, what's your process to balance um, you know, the data and strategy while being creative? Because as a young person going to your first job, a lot of times they put a lot of data in front of you, and it's hard to stay creative because of that. Well, I, I think, you know, the people I don't want creative are my lawyers and my accountants. And other than that, everybody should have a, a piece of creativity they bring to the table. If this was a fact-based business that I'm in, no show would have ever failed. You go put a show on, you test it. You know, Seinfeld, arguably one of the greatest shows in TV history, miserably failed. They gave it a six episode order almost out of pity and they had nothing else and it turned into something that, you know, it hasn't been on the air in 14 years and still does well in reruns. Yeah, I mean, do you look at the data first and go from there? Or no, you come never, just never. Just a lot of ideas and Well, forward? again, we test certain propositions. We don't test everything. So what we feel good about, we'll, we'll t do a testable proposition, but some of our most successful shows have scored the lowest and some of our highest testing shows haven't performed as well. So we get paid, for, again, if it was a perfect science, you wouldn't need me or, or other people who make decisions. So it's not. And you also have to ask yourself in the first place, who are the people sitting in a mall or going online and judging that? Are they doing it for the money? Are they doing it because they're passionate? So it's a data point, but it should never be your decision. You should never lean on it. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Yes, sir. Uh, what was your biggest failure? I'm going to see you Smith. Biggest failure, how did you overcome um, I, I, I've had so many failures that one of the things I do is block them out. <laughs> and I really can't compartmentalize. There are things that I would have liked to have done that haven't worked. There are ideas that we've had that have failed, but I don't dwell on it, and I just put it behind me and, and look forward. You know, you can't go forward looking in your rearview mirror. And I, I can't give you a specific. Um, I should, but I can't. And I really just never focus on failure, only on moving forward. I learn from them. I understand them. One of the things we do when we do a big project, we do an autopsy when it's done. And I choose the word carefully. If you do a review, that's cursory. If you do an autopsy, you dig into the guts, the liver, the brains. You dissect it. And so when we do something, I see a few people turning green. When we do something, we really want to understand. And a lot of organizations don't allow themselves to be critical of themselves. And that's one of the hardest things. Because you're human. You're defensive. And it's taken me years to, to listen to the truth. And as a leader, you have to listen to the truth, as ugly as it is sometimes. Or otherwise, you're just fooling yourself. So I think some of my failures have been when I didn't listen to the truth. Yes, sir. And then I'll get to you. Um, my name is Zach Zwiebelman. And so you mentioned mentors earlier. And I know the business school is always you know, emphasizing how important mentors are. And so I was curious, what kind of qualities, traits, and experiences do you look for in mentoring? I look for somebody that I, that I feel really cares rather than is looking to build a relationship to get promoted, but somebody who really wants to understand. And I've had a few folks that I've been mentoring for 18 years, and the dirty little secret is I get more out of it than they do. You know, so I look for, it's just like the way you pick your friends. It's really no different. People that you feel compatible, people that you have common interests and values. And um, it's hard because I can't mentor everybody, nor would that be constructive for a whole population to be mentored by me. But I, I do believe that you know, the value of experience needs to be shared. 
and, that, and then they have to pay it forward and mentor people. So I think in your situation, there are tricks and tools that older folks who've been through business school can share, and that's invaluable. And relationships and networks are something that I don't know how much they teach here, but I got my job because I had relationships with the Turner people. Um, I ran sports marketing for Coke. You saw on one of my slides a giant Coke bottle that sits on top Turner Field in Atlanta that instead of hanging a big red sign, we built a baseball refreshment theme park. And getting to know the Turner people got them to understand when they were looking for a brander that I was a good candidate. So you cannot underestimate the power of networking, meeting people, talking to people, and um, just they don't have to be your mentor, but if you spend 15 minutes with somebody, they could be an ally one day. I saw a hand from a young lady back there. Uh, my question is, uh, question regarding how to choose between different offers. So do you encourage us to be a big fish in a small pond or a small fish? If you get multiple offers, you can go I'm going to say something that probably won't be that popular with the faculty. Well, the faculty doesn't care. that You're not their problem anymore. It wouldn't be popular with your parents. Your first jobs are relevant. My first job was taking a box cutter, a feather duster, and an order pad into grocery stores. And, but what it gave me was confidence, was contacts, was the ability to do something, make my own money. I, don't, I do think today's you have too much pressure from my generation that your first job is the most important thing. It is a step. I think the fact, and I might be wrong, is I think the average person has six or seven jobs in their career. I can assure you, of all of the jobs you have, your first will be the least relevant. That's a fact. And so if you have multiple offers and you're that fortunate, go where you think you'll be the most successful and learn the most. Because life used to be a ladder. In business, used to be a ladder. You move coordinator, assistant manager, associate manager, manager, senior manager, director, senior director, vice president. Now the world's a bridge. And every time you cross a path on that bridge, you build skills. I don't care about titles. I don't care about your experience. I want skills. I want the people that work with me to be able to write a strategy, delineate a good idea, manage creative people, manage conflict, have high ethics and values. And those are things that are built with experience and skills. And so I urge all of you, resist your parents. I had a young man sit with me whose father was my roommate. And all he really wanted was to get his parents off his back. He wanted to be a writer, but they wanted him to do something else. And so all I did was encourage him to follow his dream. Because you're young, you can't fail. You can't eat crappier food or live in worse conditions than you do now. I mean, literally, prison's an upgrade to some of the places. I've been to some of these dorms, I've seen. So take your chances, build your skills, do what makes you happy. That's why I love television, you know, it's part of pop culture. Some of the shows I showed you today, you know, some you don't know, but it's part of pop culture, and I enjoy pop culture. Thank you. Thank you.